Hello, everybody. Welcome to the DKC skill meeting of the week. My name is Connor Burns, and I am currently a debater at Missouri State University, where we compete in NDTC to debate and NFALD debate as well. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself before I get into the lecture. I am currently an undergraduate student at Missouri State University, and I study geology. I started debate when I was in my freshman year of high school at Truman University, <laughs> Truman High School. And my first coach was Chris Adams. And then after my freshman year, she retired. And I was then coached by Jerry Willard and Parker Hopkins. Now at Missouri State University, I'm coached by Dr. Eric Morris and Dr. Nathan Rothenbaum. If you're interested in college debate, please feel free to reach out to me. I will be giving contact info out at the end of this lecture. We're going to be talking about the fundamentals of debate. When I say that, we are going to talk about speech times, topicality, disadvantages, counter plans, and critiques, all common arguments in debate. This is a little bit of the information about myself that I shared at the beginning of this. The basics, speech times, and the speeches themselves. There are broadly four different categories of time in a debate. The first is a constructive. It is an eight-minute speech in which you bring up and respond to new arguments. The four constructors in the debate are the 1AC, the 1NC, the 2AC, and the 2NC. After each constructive, a three-minute cross-examination period occurs where the previous speaker, or in the odd case of the 1AC, the 2N, will ask questions pertaining to arguments that were brought up in the speech. After the four, first four constructives, it flips from the outgoing first to the outgoing last. So after the 2NC and the cross-ex of that speech, there is the first negative rebuttal, the first affirmative rebuttal, the second negative rebuttal, and the second affirmative rebuttal. During the debate, the both teams will have prep time. And this is just time where you have to prepare for either your next speech or the speeches beyond that. It varies from tournament to tournament. At a lot of college tournaments or super high level high school tournaments, it will be 10 minutes. But when I was in high school, it was still five minutes of prep time at local Missouri tournaments. This is the speech order with cross-examination. Uh, it says the 1AC happens and the 2N will ask questions about the 1AC. Then after the, 1A, after the 1NC, the 1A will ask questions about that. The 1N will ask questions about the 2AC, and the 2A will ask questions about the 2NC. After that, like I said earlier, it flips. The first negative rebuttal occurs, then the first affirmative rebuttal, the second negative rebuttal, and the second affirmative rebuttal. Then we also have arguments that we can talk about. The broad frame of arguments that are most commonly brought up in introductory debates are stock issues. It says here, solvency, harms, inherency, topicality, and significance. We'll go into each of these. Solvency is what the affirmative plan does and how it solves the harms that are presented. Harms are what the status quo is, or as we'll talk about later, uniqueness. Inherency is what is currently happening in the status quo so as to prevent the plan from occurring. Topicality is what the plan does within the realms of the topic. And significance is exactly what it sounds like, how significant the affirmative is. Topicality, there are four parts to this argument. The first is an interpretation. If we take this year's high school topic, it is about fiscal redistribution. And the affirmative must do it in three, or three and or more ways. That's just factually incorrect. There is a list of three or four options and the affirmative can pick one of those options. Let's take a universal basic income, for example. 
the interpretation would be that universal basic income is a fixed steady payment over the course of time. The violation could be that the affirmative is not fixed and deviates. Standards are not super common at the higher levels of debate, but they can be important to help you understand topicality. The voters are reasons why it matters within the round. Commonly, you'll hear people talk about clash, limits, and ground. Limits are the ability to prepare for a debate. If the affirmative is questionably topical or not topical, it could explode those limits and make it much harder for the negative to prepare. Ground means that there is the way that the affirmative presents the plan negates the ability for the negative to read core grounded arguments, such as you say like the F on the fiscal redistribution topic makes it to where the UBI is eventually repaid back into the system. Well, that could deck any spending disads from the negative perspective. But as with all things, there are various ways to answer it. The first is that you could say that we meet their interpretation of the topic. This with the example of a UBIF that repays back into the system and say, we meet, we are a fixed steady payment. Then you can talk about, you can propose your own model for the debate, which is a counter interpretation. It basically says that we think that UBI is this thing, and that can include the, that needs to include the affirmative. You also then need to make arguments about the voters that the negative is made. If they read a limits to said, you could say we're good for limits because it is grounded in literature or something like that. You can also make arguments about why you're good for ground, but it ultimately does depend on the F. And a very important thing that I think more affirmatives need to make pushes on is reasonability. It's an argument that says that good is good enough in terms of topicality debates. You don't need to be debating about the technical minutia of some niche legal action when we could talk about the broader implications we, uh, what we'll talk about next which are disadvantages, counterplans, and critiques. First with this ads, there are four different parts of it. The uniqueness, the link, the internal link, and the impact. The uniqueness is what is happening in the status quo now. For a spending disad that we talked about earlier, it could be something as simple as spending low now. The F makes us spend more which would be the link, the internal link would be that spending escalates very quickly. And the impact would be something along the lines of that increased spending means that we're no longer funding X program. Or if you listen to college or the high level TOC policy rounds, it'll say something along the lines of extinction. When you answer a disad though, there are a lot of different ways. I would say that the best way is to one non unique the disad. The negative says spending low now, you say spending high. You can then read link defense or no link the disad. The F doesn't trigger that increase. And then you can also read that there's no impact, or you can say that the impact happening is good, which is an impact term. You'll notice that it says no link slash turn. A link turn is saying that the F triggering the link is a good thing. Um, but it's very important not to double turn yourself. If the negative reads uh, growth decline leads to extinction argument, and you say, one, it doesn't lead to extinction, two, the degrowth that happens is good, you can't link turn the disad and also say the app generates growth because all of a sudden you generate growth, but growth is bad. So you read a new disad to the affirmative. When you, another important element for both sides of the disadvantage debate is impact calculus. I always remembered it as Mr. T, magnitude, risk, and time frame. Magnitude is how big the impact is. 
time frame is the rate at which it happens. Econ decline can either happen overnight or it can take many, many months or years. And the way that we determine what the risk of the advantage or disadvantage is, is by multiplying those two together and getting the risk. You should compare risk when you're debating disads because ultimately it gives the judge a lot more insight as to how they should view the round. The next argument is called a counter plan. Counter plans have four parts. The first is a counter plan text. It's what the counter plan does. When I was debating, a very common counter plan was the state's counter plan, which would require the United States, the states to compose the United States, and the relevant territories do the affirmative. Then you would read a card that talks about why that solves. Quite commonly, with a state's counter plan, you would either read a politics disad or some sort of federalism disadvantage. And a very important part of counter plans is mutual exclusivity or what are called competition arguments. We're going to talk about those more when we talk about how to answer a counter plan. The way that I would re always recommend answering a counter plan is trying to stop it. You want to make arguments about solvency, theory, offense, and then permutations. Solvency is that the counter plan does not solve the app. If somebody reads a 50 states counter plan against your federally funded app, you can make arguments about how the counter plan doesn't solve because it requires federal funding for the whatever the app is doing. Three arguments are things like conditionality. Conditionality means the negative can kick out of the position should they choose. And you can read arguments about why that is bad. There's also other sorts of theory arguments like agent counterplans are bad, process counterplans are bad, things like that. Then you need to read some sort of offense on top of the solvency arguments. You can say that a counterplan links to the net benefit, and that means that even if the counterplan happens, the thing that it supposedly doesn't cause will still happen. You can also make arguments that there's no net benefit, which are pretty similar to links to the net benefit. Or you can also read an add-on. And what an add-on is, is when you read a new internal link or and impact to the affirmative, that the counterplane does not solve. Then we will talk about permutations. Permutations are challenging the ability of the counterplan to compete with the affirmative, which goes back to the mutual exclusivity part of reading a counterplan. Permutations can be read as perm do both, which means do both the affirmative and the counterplan can make arguments like perm do the counterplan, which means that we do the counterplan because it in effect does the affirmative. You can read as many permutations as you would like or as little as you like. It's all just to test the way that the counterplan competes with the affirmative. The next style of argument that we're going to talk about are critiques. Critiques consist of four things, but typically you only see three red and the first negative constructed. Those things are a link, an impact, and an alternative. I think the easiest way to think of a counter plan is a non-unique disad with a counter plan on top of it. A very common counter plan that was, or I'm sorry, critique that was read when I was in high school revolved around settler colonialism. My senior year was the water topic, and a lot of the arguments were that the way that the affirmative interacts with water is continuing the settler colonial project and, dispossess and dispossesses indigenous people of the relation to the water that the affirmative was affecting. The impact of that would be the ongoing disposition of indigenous land or settler colonialism. And there are numerous ways, or there are a lot of different ways that have been posed to solve those issues. The most common one is decolonization, which 
is based off of a 2012 essay called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor by Tuck and Yang. The fourth part of the critique is framework. This is commonly brought up in the 2NC, and it's a model for the debate. And the model posits that the a very common one is that the AF should have to defend all of the assumptions that they make about the world. Because ultimately what a critique is, is a testing of the AF's assumptions about how the world operates. So a very common one that I saw during high school was that if the AF has perpetuated settler colonialism, they should lose. But th there are a variety of framework arguments from just flat out, don't weigh the AF to we get links to the representations of the affirmative. When you're answering critiques, there are six different ways that you can. Where first thing that we're going to talk about are things that still apply from counterplans. You can test the competition of the alternative. You can read theory arguments, and you can test the way the solvency of the alternative. A lot of critiques will make broad sweeping claims about the world and how the world operates, and they think that once they get to stopping the way that the world operates because it's bad, that will solve the affirmative. But you can make arguments about why the alternative does not solve the way that the world operates. You can also read more offense against the alternative. You can make arguments about the alternative resulting in more violence. And then you also need to read arguments against the link. These can be as simple as link defense, such as we don't link to the K, but what you can also read is that, no, the affirmative actually solves those things, which would be a link turn. Against Ks that aren't rooted in identity, such as capitalism, critiques of capitalism, critiques of uh, psychoanalysis, or various other things, you can impact turn those arguments. The impact turn to the cap K is just capitalism good. And you can really flesh out that argument because there's a lot of literature about why capitalism is good. But there are numerous critiques out there that can be responded to via impact turns. But the idea of impact turning in a, a critique based on identity is bad because you're, you'd often have to say like settler colonialism is good, which is factually incorrect and morally repre irreprehensible. To summarize what we talked about today, we first talked about speech times and the order of speeches in the debate. We then talked about stock issues, which are solvency, harms, inherency, topicality, and significance. We then talked about disadvantages, counterplans, and critiques. And then we finally talked about how to answer all of those arguments. I'd like to thank you for listening to this lecture. Once again, my name is Connor Burns. If you would like to contact me about doing college debate, you can write to this email and I will put you in contact with either Dr. Eric Morris or Dr. Nathan Rothenbaum. Or if you're not interested in Missouri State, I can give you the next steps to debating for other schools. Once again, thank you for listening to this lecture. And please do not be afraid of reaching out to me if you have any extra questions or interest in the debate.